Today we're going to begin this discussion with uh, some sage advice from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. Do not panic. None of this will make any sense today. That's what tomorrow is for. Today my uh, advice to you is just to sit back, get all this written down, have something to refer to when you're looking at it later, and uh, what we're going to do to is I'm going to kind of lay it all out there today. It won't make any sense. Tomorrow we'll take care of everything. We'll come back the day after and it'll all start making sense. I want to go back to the Bohr model of the atom. You remember that in the Bohr model we had electrons and the electrons could jump around. Woo! Let's have an electron here. Here we go. We have an electron. And the electrons could jump around back and forth, back and forth. And that entire idea uh, visualizes electrons as a particle. Well, we just spent... That says particle, trust me. We just spent a long time convincing ourselves that electrons really cannot be adequately modeled as a particle. We need to actually think of them as a wave. And so that's where Schrodinger comes in. Same guy as the cat. Couldn't figure out how to make an umlaut with the smart board, so there we go. Schrodinger's time-dependent wave equation. This is the wave mechanical model. It's a great big complicated math thing that even if I wanted you to do, you couldn't because it involved calculus. Good old calculus. So you don't need to know really how to do anything with that, but I wanted to introduce it to you so that you could appreciate how awesome physical chemistry is. If you won't ever actually, actually use this until you go to college, and even then probably not until your junior year if you're a chemistry major. But that's what it is, and uh, you'll notice some things in here. You have this little thing. That's called, it's pronounced, it's a Greek letter, we pronounce it psi. Just like S-I-G-H. It's spelled P-S-I. And that is called, it has a name, it's called the wave function. And you don't, again, you don't need to really know a whole lot about what that means other than it's the wave function. You might have heard that the wave function collapses, blah, 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 in some of the other videos that we talked about, and that's what it's talking about. And whenever we say uh, wave function, we're talking, oh my goodness, we don't want that. Oh, I just screwed up. <laughs> there we go. So, uh, where are you? There we go. Here's the wave function. If you look at this... Uh, Here's the Wikipedia article on the wave function. You don't need to know all that, but if you look over here on the side, you'll see that we have some just kind of some graphs of things kind of oscillating back and forth. And th when we say wave function, we're just talking about a mathematical description of one of those. So <coughs> that all of that, all those complicated math descriptions of we just saw uh, visualized in graphs would be encapsulated in what we call the wave function or psi. And this big, long, complicated mess of an equation can tell us things. It can tell us things about electrons. Uh, the first thing that we can do is we can understand that we can take a nucleus. So here's a nucleus. You've got some nucleus. And let's say there's an electron somewhere out here. And we're not sure where it is, so we're going to just kind of look there. We're going to look and see whether there's an electron there and find out about what the properties of that electron would be if it were there. And so we can take this, this uh, if from math we know that if this is our origin, if this is 0, 0, we know that that point has an x value, a y value, and a z value, and we can take those values and we can plug them up here uh, along with some assumptions about the energy state of the electron, and it can spit out things, and we can solve different things. One of the things that we can solve for is called psi squared. So we can take this information about this electron, plug it in here, and it'll spit out this thing called psi squared. And you don't know what that is, but I'm going to tell you right now what it is. Psi squared is call is the probability of finding an electron. Oops, ran out of room to write electron there really wish that this board were oriented properly, or could be oriented properly. There we go. Uh, probability of finding an electron at a given point. And that number will usually, will have to be somewhere between 
0 and 1. 0 would mean 0%, 1 would mean 100% chance. Obviously, you can't have less than a 0% or more than a 100% chance of finding an electron there. So it has to end up somewhere in that range. So let's say that we did that calculation and we found out that for this particular space that uh, psi squared equaled 0.8. Well, that means we have an 80% chance of finding an electron there. That means that if we looked here and we said, is there an electron here? And if we did that, made that question, asked that question 10 times, eight times it would say, yes, there's an electron there. And two times we would miss it. It's a probability thing. So no longer can we talk about where the electron is, but we can talk instead about where it is likely to be if we were to look. Like with the two slits, you never knew where the electron was going to hit. But over a course of time, you could figure out what the pattern was going to be. And so if we found a different point, let's say that we asked, plugged the same question into this point, we might find that psi squared at that point equaled 0.95, which is a 95% chance of finding the electron. Interestingly enough, if we go out and out and out farther and farther and farther, we'd get smaller and smaller percent chances, uh, uh, you know, 5%. Woo! we get smaller and smaller chances as we go farther and farther out. In fact, we go all the way to Pluto and look for it there, and we still wouldn't get a 0% chance of finding it. We would just get a really, 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 really small number. That's one of the interesting things about quantum mechanics. Very few things are impossible. They're just improbable instead. And so now that we kind of know what that is, well, what, what can we do with this information? What, that's what Schrodinger's equation gives us. It gives us those probabilities at different points around the nucleus. So why do we care? What can we do with that? Let's go back to our nucleus. What if <coughs> we were interested in asking the following question? Where is it likely to be? Well, it depends on what you mean by likely. We're going to say that if you find it there half the time that that's likely or 100% of the time, how often does it have to be found there in order to say that it's likely? Well, what scientists have agreed on is they've said 90%. They said if psi squared is greater than or equal to 90%, we're going to call that likely. And so what we can do then is we can take this nucleus and we can basically using Schrodinger's equation and this takes supercomputers to do because it's so mathematically complicated uh, we can find and plot every point around that nucleus that has a 90% or greater chance of having an electron found there and what we end up finding is we have this sort of dotted misty area around here where it's likely to be found. And in fact, I'm doing a two-dimensional model. This is a, looks like a circle, doesn't it? Well, it's actually a sphere. It's three-dimensional. So you'd have to kind of visualize a sphere. And so what we find is that, that that picture looks spherical for this particular kind of electron. And this is called an S orbital if it's spherical. These are the lowest energy orbitals. And if we uh, go plug in some of the same kinds of questions uh, using a higher energy electron, uh, we would get a different shape, as it turns out. We would get a shape that would look more like this. We would see that the nucleus was there, and you might see that you would have sort of a double sphere, or as I call it, a, a dum-dum, a dum, not dum-dum, a dumbbell kind of shape a sideways figure eight. And you know, this is higher energy than that is. And that sort of makes sense. Go back to the waves and the springs. We have a node here, right in here in the middle where the electron is not likely to be, and a higher energy. And we'll see uh, later that they can get more and more complicated at higher and higher energies. And this kind of orbital is called a p orbital. There are other kinds of orbitals that I'm not going to draw right now. We'll get to them later. There's d orbitals and there's f orbitals. As it turns out, there's only one kind, uh, there's most energy levels only have one of the s orbitals. They have three of the p orbitals. They have five of the d orbitals, and they have seven of the f orbitals. Now, that won't make any, any sense to you whatsoever right now. 
which is okay. Don't panic. We're going to come back. This is all going to get cleared up tomorrow. So <coughs> let me go tell you one more thing about these. Let's talk about the quantum numbers. I've added a lot of quantum number descriptions to your vocab that's not in the book. Those all relate to this Schrodinger equation. These have to do with the values that you plug in to the Schrodinger equation to get these different energy states. And there are four quantum numbers that completely describe electrons. These are the four uh, numbers that completely describe an electron. And the numbers are represented by variables n, l, m, and s. The first quantum number, n, is the principal energy level quantum number. And it can be any number. L is, uh, we ref that refers to which sublevel the electron is in which is a vocab word. You probably don't process exactly what that means right now. Um, but there is, there are, well, we won't get into that right now. The third quantum number is M, stands for the orbital. And uh, <coughs> there, uh, this is actually what we were talking about earlier with there being one S orbital, there being three P orbitals, uh, five Ds and seven Fs. Again, that won't make a whole lot of sense right now, but the last thing is the spin quantum number. The spin quantum number, uh, we won't really say anything about right now, but there are two possible spins uh, for an electron. An electron can spin up or down. So, there you go. There is your introduction generally to the wave mechanical model of uh, the atom given to us by Schrodinger, including orbitals, some of the different kinds of shapes, and the organization we haven't gotten into. And it probably, like I said, doesn't make a lot of sense right now, but we will understand it much better. I have a little story that I'll tell you later that will hopefully help.